Schönen guten Morgen. Good morning to everyone. We are very happy to have so many people here to participate in our conference for digitization and sustainability. The conference is the first of its kind, and we are happy to have met with such a such an overwhelming response. Over 1,300 tickets were sold, and it's such a pleasure for us to see that so many people would like to participate, would like to be active. We are a group of 10 small and also bigger organizations working in the field of uh, environmental protection, development po policy, and digitalization. I myself represent an environmental organization, the umbrella organization of German environmental organizations. And it is a great pleasure for me to so see so many environmentalists who would like to contribute to this conference. There will be lots of workshops, lots of talks uh, where they can present themselves. I also would like to thank the German Federal Foundation for the Environment. They were so kind as to support us financially. Without their financial support, this conference could not have happened. Once again, thanks to the Foundation. Hello, good morning. I'm Hendrik Zimmermann. I come from German Watch. Welcome to all of you. We at German Watch are a participant of uh, Bits and Bäume, this conference. We have been a co-organizer because we think that digitalization is important for every sphere of our life, like, for instance, the energy uh, transformation, the preservation of resources and the agricultural transformations. We have put together a great program for this conference, and we, as one of the organizers, have started a call for participation. And this call for participation was, long, was ended in August, and we were so impressed to get 231 entries, 231 organizations, people who would like to contribute to this conference. And so it was very difficult for us to pick the right ones. Hi, I'm Teresa Hoffman. I represent Bread for the World. And out of all the entries we have received, uh, we have chosen 130 items for our program. And so this is what you're going to have today and tomorrow, a program with 130 different uh, contributions, and we are looking forward to it. I am Vivian Frick from Technical University Berlin. Next to the program that mainly is based on contributions from our audience, we thought we would have something special. You are here in the um, in the Ada Hall, and uh, we have uh, developed a special program for you. So have fun. I am Nicolai Gunot. I am representing the concept of new economy. We do not have a lot of statistical data because data protection is important to us, but we have a few numbers we can mention regarding the gender issue. According to our statistical survey, we have had one-fourth of all entries for contributions coming from women, one-half from men, and one-fourth where no gender was indicated, and maybe they did that uh, for data protection reasons or because they didn't want to make a statement up about their gender. There are a few contributions that should not be divided in a binary way. We also have a number of international guests at our conference, and it is a great pleasure for us to say that we have international participants. I cannot mention every one of them, but they come from all kinds of all regions of the world. For instance, we have panels with Chen Chan, Pat Muni, Claude Kabemba. They're going to be here in order to also introduce another perspective to this conference. I am Oyane 
Krüger from uh, Open Knowledge Foundation Germany. And it's a pleasure for me to introduce the slogan of our conference. We would like to bring communities uh, together. We are happy that we indeed were able to attract people from all kinds of different organizations. And so we are going to hear about interesting projects, initiatives, organizations who work in all kinds of areas of sustainability. We are going to have people from development organization and from uh, technology. Those of you who would like to meet spontaneously to develop ideas or plans we have prepared a special room for you. Sometimes you cannot get, uh, get answers to all your questions during the general uh, panels, and that is why we have opened a chat room where you can spontaneously exchange ideas. And we'd be happy if, based on such a chat, new ideas would emerge for us to shape the future together. I am Sven Hilwig. I work for Bread for the World. This Congress uh, would not have been possible without the intensive of, uh, work of our Congress office. The team consists of three people, Yekaterina, Katja and Eva. These three ladies have been very active over the last six uh, months to plan the rooms, the catering, the, t the equipment. They have communicated with hundreds of uh, speakers. They ca take care of our assistants, and they've organized the forum. And I would like to thank those three ladies. And may they have a round of applause, please. I'm Anja Höfner. I work at the Institute for Ecological Economic Research, and this conference would not have been possible hadn't it been for the financial support of the German Environmental Foundation. Thanks for this sponsoring. As I said, uh, the wide scope of this conference could not have been organized without such a generous sponsor. I also would like to thank the Ministry of Economics, uh, and it also funds and it also sponsors a number of projects within the framework of this conference. Rolf Huschmann from the Association for the Environment and, Envir and uh, Landscape Protection. I think uh, it is very important to see digitalization in the light of sustainability. And uh, what is also important for us to have something to eat. We are going to have vegan food, uh, organic food, and those of you who have time to prepare the meal, they can help us cut the veggies. We will start preparing lunch at 10.30. So those of you who would like to do something in the kitchen, please report to the information desk at the entrance. Leon Kaiser, I write for Nets Politik. Network uh, politics. Uh, we are the 11th media partner organization. I wanted to thank all honorary assistants, helpers who have made this conference possible. Uh, we are going to have an apéro at 10 o'clock uh, on the floor, on the upper floor behind this hall. Lisa Jungans has organized this apéro, and I hope you'll enjoy it. I'm Rana Riak from the Forum for ECT, ICT Specialists for Responsibility and Sustainability. We are the techies in the room. That is to say, we try to explain technology to those who would like to discuss it polit politically. The interesting thing about this uh, conference is we have a lot of knowledge about the technical aspects, but uh, of course, uh, we, as we all know, computer are just one component. And it is important for us to uh, talk about what we know and uh, listen to those who tell us things that we don't know. And that's the interesting thing. It's all about listening to each other during this conference. Whenever you meet, it is important not only to talk, but also to listen. And as I said, uh, 
When you look around, you find uh, beautiful lighting and a beautiful decoration. And I think this good atmosphere is also important. And we'd like to thank Paradiso for having provided us with this cozy and comfy atmosphere. We also have the uh, demystification discourse of discourse machine. If you know what, if you want to know what this is, uh, go and look around for this machine. It will be interesting. I promise. Good morning. I'm Constanze Kurz. I'm the spokesperson of the Chaos Computer Club. We are the largest European hacker association. Currently, we have over 9,000 members. And I'm going to tell you a trick for future conference planning. Invite a few hackers because what we are going to do is provide the conference video streaming. So I'm, I'm going to welcome now the people at the uh, streaming service. Our center does not only do the streaming, but also a recording of uh, the conference for the next two days. We are going to record video and sound, and you will find a download version. Uh, find them in different formats as pure audio files or audio video files. We also help to provide the infrastructure because you know you need a lot of technology for such a conference, and we hope we are going to have a smooth conference. If not, we've got a few hackers who can get things right if something goes wrong. All right, I'm the last person. I am Mr. Santarius. I come from Technical University Berlin and also from the Institute for Ecological Economic Research. We are the supporters of this conference, the organizers. It took us one and a half uh, years to plan this conference. Hot topics, many creative ideas came in for the practical organization of the conference. It was a lot of fun working in the run-up to this conference, but it was also a lot of work. I am now going to hand over to the opening where we are going to have Constanze Kurz, myself and Lawrence Hilty. We'd like to introduce a number of uh, themes, topics and goals that this conference pursues. All right, it's a birthday party that we'd like to celebrate. Happy birthday, 70 years. What happened uh, 70 years ago in 1948? Somebody had an idea. You know which one? Yes, she said it. It was in 1948 where the transistor was invented. Interestingly enough, uh, the transistor was invented both in the U.S. and in Germany. Without the transistor, we wouldn't have had any integrated circuits, uh, no microprocessors, and without them, our computers, laptops, and tablets would have electronic tubes, and they would be as big as whole rooms or maybe even as big as this very room, and that would be a boring thing to have. So 70 years ago, 1948, the invention of the transistor, but there was even something more important in that year, namely the General Declaration on Human Rights and Freedoms was uh, adopted, a very important thing. You can read all about it. The inviolable dignity of every single pe person on earth was enshrined in this declaration, and this declaration set out the rights that people have against violence coming from the states in a domestic fear or business. What is interesting to note is that after 1948, two different uh, themes were discussed to make these rights of human beings more concrete, the political and uh, civic rights. The UN United Nations uh, Civil Pact was adopted. and. I mean, the technologists, uh, they uh, are very much focused on uh, political rights, f f 
the right to have freedom to information, opinion, freedom of the press, freedom or the right to privacy. Many of that is enshrined in these documents. And at the same time, in 1948, a second pact was negotiated, namely the economic, social and cultural human rights were included in a pact. And uh, this is very much what the sustainability people are focused on, the UN Social Pact. It concerns the elementary rights of uh, people, the right to water, health care, and prosperity and income. Though the civic rights are very much in danger today and threatened in many countries because they are being ignored. And we also have uh, increasing dangers for human rights because of populism and digitalization, as Constanze is going to explain later on. Political and cultural and social rights are always suffering because of that. The social and cultural rights, the existential rights, are threatened by corrupt elites, crisis, conflict, wars, and climate change that is progressing. And it's a threat to the very basis for the existence of human beings, the two to three billion people on Earth who are directly living of nature. And their harvests uh, get worse because of extreme weather conditions. Floods uh, wash their houses away. So in order to implement uh, the full set of uh, social and cultural rights is is necessary to stop environmental pollution. And that is why the 70th uh, anniversary of the human rights, this is what brings two communities together. We bring together what belongs together, the technical and environmental actors. We would like to fight together for the inviolable rights of human beings. We would like to have a world where every person can have his or her rights fulfilled and where the boundaries of our planet are being respected. Ja, ich glaube, Menschheit so I think in mankind we are at a watershed point these days because um, there will be a fundamental change in the relation potentially between man and nature. So man always served himself when it came to nature. But how did this evolve ever since the apes came back, came down from the trees? So human being kind of shed sna snake-like skins and this allowed them to engage into material metabolism. The f so the very first skin is our physical skin. It's to do with transpiration perspiration, uh, aspiration, metabolism, ex um, secreting metabolistic waste products. And on this level already, the natural consumption amounts to 800 kilograms per person per year. Well, thousands of years ago, human beings started uh, creating a second skin, skin in the form of garments, uh, uh, houses, cultural tools, abodes, etc. At this second level, the natural consumption is about two to five tons per annum per capita. And you need to bear in mind that these days, maybe 50% of human beings still can make and gain a livelihood with that natural consumption. And then uh, two or three years ago, uh, uh, two or three hundred years ago, a, s a third skin came in, the industrial skin, uh, high-rise buildings, st uh, steel towers, uh, swimming pools, laptops, airports, what have you. And this industrial skin accounts for about 50 to 70 tons per capita per annum. For the reasons of the environmental footprint and sustainability, this creates a big problem because the metabolism of that skin is 10 times as high as would be viable on this planet Earth. Now we are in the middle of uh, destroying this wonderful blue planning into an ungastly, unsightly desert unless we make this skin become leaner, unless we reduce our energy consumption and resource consumption by a factor of 10. And that is a pivotal claim and tenet of the entire sustainable 
the T movement now until the present day. And now, bits Boimer Publikum, please uh, bear in mind that we are in the middle of uh, creating a fourth skin. Um, this skin contain, contains of virtual uh, digital information. It's a web. It's a cop, it's a, a network of information which is becoming evidence uh, uh, surrounding us and the planet. And the big question is how many resources will be consumed by that fourth upcoming skin? We are not very clear about the answer. This is part of this conference. There's a huge need of, for, for further research. But however, laptops, smartphones, tablets, especially also the IP centers the computing centers, the relay stations, requires, requires tremendous resources. This is what we know. And something else we already know for certain is that in terms of consumption, energy is required. So we need power consumption in order to power all these uh, computers. About 10% of the global power consumption is accrued for, is accounted for by the internet and all these uh, data centers. And these scenarios indicate that the share of the power contribution for information for the IT. TC will continue to rise, although you see that the consumer end use devices may, may require less um, power in the future, but uh, through our data centers and industrial power consumption, the power increase, uh, power demand will increase. And this was a challenge for sustainability. But the um, clue about this is that the fourth skin, the information skin, uh, provides a huge opportunity. We can use digitalization in order to shed the uh, overarching energy consumption of the third skin to make the superfluous redundant. Just to give you an idea, in the energy sector, more digitization will allow us to make 100% uh, green energy supply in a country such as Germany when it comes to transportation. The entry into mass transit, uh, into share ride sharing, into environmental transport uh, Turn around will make will become far easier in the wake of digitization. In the consumer field, we have used uh, platforms. We have eBay. We have can can consume other things, secondhand things, and reduce our consumption patterns as a result. Now the big question is how can we shape a uh, green, sustainable uh, digitization? There's a clear answer to that only if we can harness the powers of ITC, information telecommunication communi communication in order to reduce the overall um, boarding or excessive power demands of the industrialized countries. And this is the only way in which uh, this can create, make a change for the better. In other words, we need digital sufficiency or subsistence in order to allow digitalization to make a contribution towards sustainability. Thank you very much. And let me also draw your attention to another aspect. At Bits and Bäume, there are going to be two major strands in the discussion, threads in the discussion which cover this. First of all, the thread, how, what is the weight of the of a bit? This is about material and energy and alternative software. And uh, the second thread reclaims Smart City, the, which is about the transformation in the energy, urban planning, uh, development, etc and the turnaround here. So no digitalization would be sustainable. Uh, no development would be sustainable unless it were to make a contribution towards social equity. Without uh, ecology, you'd have no justice. Without uh, justice, you have no um, equity in ecology. And in, as a matter of fact, digital tools offer us a plethora of opportunities in order to enable um, citizens and politically active people to provide them with a voice also in order to create a more democratic economy. Uh, through sharing, we become less dependent on multinational companies. Uh, we have presuming um, platforms where we can offer each other our self-harvested tomatoes. We can offer power uh, generated on our solar panels to our no neighbors. Sharing of knowledge, neighborhood help. Uh, sharing of drills, drill machines, for instance, are great opportunities in order to make for a more democratic economy. But in a social sphere, we also see certain dangers. First of all, as uh, robots, uh, automation, AI, um, all of this uh, potentially may rationalize jobs in the future. 
which will no longer be necessary and there's a big problem about this around this the danger of losing your job through digital replacement is highest when it comes to the low income brackets this is what you can see on these charts so the highest performers are best protected against these um um, against these developments and the most vulnerable uh, should be most concerned about losing their job potentially. But on the other hand, we also see the rise of new jobs in the wake of digitalization. But more likely than not, scenarios indicate that most jobs that will be created won't be located in the high wage bracket like IT or software coders. But the m most jobs will be created in the low wage uh, sector, like uh, those people wearing and uh, working in warehouses at Amazon or click workers, etc. And apart from that, apart from the danger for job and for income losses, we also see a huge danger of a massive capital accumulation, which has already taken place. Microsoft is already at the top 10 earning companies worldwide now it's been overtaken by apple facebook amazon also chinese com companies are catching up massively the top 10 companies are digital players and players and they ha uh, concentrate a huge massive financial clouds all in all these developments create a divisive defect for digitalization digitalization is exactly not becoming more democratic but it's leading to a power shift it's leading to an aggregation of capital in the hands of a select few and of course that becomes very visible if you look at the international arena who can tap data flows in order to turn this into dollars who are the people who benefit from the digital devices on this chart you see all the uh, devices that are connected with the internet and i think they that speaks you know to really a big volume so it tells us an awful lot so we need digital tools for the more democratic economy and at bits and boimer we want to put the question what are the tools that will turn out as the tools of the powers that be and promote the status quo and um, redistribute um bottom-up uh, affluence and what are the good tools quote unquote in which will help us transform the economy towards democracy participation and eye level involvement so these are the pressing questions to put this in a nutshell we want to discuss the term digital democracy in the economy and there here again we have two big threads at bits and boimer first of all digital capitalism and then the thread of alternative economy and digitization for degrowth ladies and gentlemen guys i'm coming to the end and i'm going to pass the baton on now let me talk about the objectives here let's not just celebrate a birthday of course 70 years of human rights is a good occasion but we should also use this occasion to network in order to share ideas to learn from the uh, two different uh, communities but also to agree to uh, disagree but always with due respect and through networking let's shape a better world a digital future that takes a uh, boundaries of the planet seriously and um, st stands up for the rights of human beings and also let's become political digitalization is no longer just something that takes pl place in our pockets but uh, forms very much heart of the society we want to come up with a to-do list for politicians so that they can make sure that digitalization will become uh, democratic and we want to tell companies what they need to do in order to prevent the worst effects or make a change for the better and we want to provide um, possible options for potential users of digital tools uh, in order to make sure that digitalization will have a sustainable effect thank you very much on that no note and let me pass the baton on to Constanze <coughs> Ich möchte gerne ein paar Aspekte hinzufügen zu dem, was Tillmann gesagt hat. Let me say one or two words on what Tillmann said, also in terms of the motivation and also in terms of the contribution of the tech community with regard to this discussion. And I think, you know, we need to become political. I think that's my buzzword. 
That's what Tillman said. Four years ago, or, or many years ago, f 12 or 13 years ago, I spoke to another hacker who is also going to take the floor uh, on the topic of platform capitalism, and we did a workshop in Ventland. So, um, it was uh, activists and you know, nuclear transport, and we tried to speak to them about anonymization, protection against eavesdropping, eavesdropping, encryption, and we held a workshop in a community center in Wendland, socially vulnerable area of Germany. So for me, that was a very formative experience. Uh, just to see that this environmental and green movement was a grassroots movement that was so powerful in that region of Wendland. And uh, ever since, I've ha been harboring uh, an important hope. I've been hoping that this kind of development might also form for the field of digital human rights. If I think back 10 years ago, how we spoke about the um, uh, you know, with regard to the um, ad hoc uh, on spec uh, data um, storage of the German government. But let's just think about four years of uh, Snowden publication. Let's just think back to the fact that we are living in a mass surveillance state and uh, the fact that our digital surveillance options of our metadata and of our individual data are a matter of course with which we leave, live. But on the other hand, we also see uh, the, the sense of powerlessness but also the kind of fatigue, a kind of nonchalance attitude. And therefore, um, you know, indifference. And when I became involved in preparing this conference, I was also fueled by the, by the desire to learn how did the environmental movement manage to meet its goal? How did it act? What, what are its campaigning capacities? And what can we as techies learn from the green um, movement? And where can we help out? In order to understand this massive sea change that's currently taking place, we need to look behind the tech itself. This is why our keynote speaker is, uh, you know, an IT guy, not only an IT guy, guy, and we need to take informed cho choices. And this is where the tech community comes in. I would very much welcome it if we part ways again on Sunday, if we looked back to two days of in-depth learning, if there um, um, were sound networks with Stillman mentioned, and uh, if we could identify future projects where we can foster a cooperation, joint uh, collaboration with regard to goals which the tech community shares with the environmental movement. But also, you know, with regard to human rights, of course, we also share these goals. In the digital sphere, there are four fundamental rights which have been, you know, curtailed massively in recent years. So the fact that all of us uh, communicate di digitally means that uh, the German Fernmeldegeheimnis has been abrogated in, Ge in Europe. We are the nations which has most eavesdropping. I mean, if we ignore the intelligence services uh, for time being. But we also have the uh, informational self-determination right. Uh, it's being very much discussed, but it's no longer a reality, especially because we're living in a commercial world where all our communication takes place through ad finance networks, if we're honest. So these are the questions which we urgently need to discuss. I think by now, 11 years ago, we came up with a new basic law. Uh, we received it uh, from the Federal Court of um, Justice in Karlsruhe. So actually the legislator ignored the court ruling and uh, it curtailed the right to privacy of uh, our communication and of our uh, terminal devices. It wasn't implemented into legal practice. We need to call for it. It won't be given to us as a heaven sent. This is what we learned from the environmental movement. If we need rights, we need to fight for these rights with regard to our digital future. And I think this is where the um, environmental movement really made major strides. They made put things on the agenda and uh, made mainstream certain things. And uh, this is where we can learn from them. So as far as digital 
um, t digital rights are concerned, digital basic rights are concerned, um, we are always inspired by the hope that the European Court of Justice or the Federal Court uh, of Justice in Karlsruhe will correct uh, the politician's mistake. And in view of the fact that right now we have appointed we will be appointing the second professional politician to the Supreme Court. Um, I am losing hope. I'm becoming uh, despondent with regard to God's rule, also with regard to the European Court of Justice. Or, um, and, um, you know, we have just filed uh, um, a court case um, and uh, it's been we received a positive verdict here. But I mean, as a civil society, we need to become involved and we could, sh shouldn't bank on the courts. But this is where we can learn a lot from the environmental movement, also from the matter of court, from the fact um, that we discuss in the environment and sustainability issues now with a very matter of course attitude in our society at large. And now, before I speak, ask the next speaker to join me on stage. Let me end on an on a plea. I think we should preserve one thing. This applies both to the environmental movement and to the tech movement. We should remain skeptical and independent independence and this relates to funding and uh, the question how independently can we pronounce ourselves in the political arena on these matters and how um, serious do we take our values I think this is something which we can discuss over the next two days I look forward to an in interesting uh, conference it's great to introduce Lawrence Hilti who hopefully go is going to address our uh, joint uh, journey uh, in this keynote. Over to you. Yeah, vielen Dank. Yes, thank you. I was very happy to receive your invitation because I was intrigued by the title of the conference, Bits and Trees. Reminds me of uh, the time of my studies. I studied, uh, studied informatics, and uh, that was a long time ago. And there were usually two type of people: the nerds, fascinated by technology, and they said, "Well, they know the bits, and every one of them, they even know their first names." And they were the so-called environmentalists, and they knew every tree and what the name of the tree was. And usually they didn't talk to e each other, the uh, nerds and the environmentalists. Now we finally get together many years after. I have to stand at the rostrum. I am going to uh, rely on my notes and not going to show a presentation. Let me start with three theses, digital technology has the potential to reduce the energy and material consumption drastically. And that is the prerequisite for more self-determination in terms of the use of energy and materials. This, this is a very important thesis, and there is a potential for us to do a lot of good. But thesis number two, we use digital technology so far not appropriately. So the digital technology can no, not yet tap this full potential. Usually we do the opposite. Energy and materials consumption is increasing as we have seen in Tillman's presentation. Can you please get a bit closer to the microphone, I was told. Uh, is it better for you? Can you hear me better? So thesis two, we use digital technology so far not appropriately and digital technology cannot for that reason f use its full potential. In many areas we do quite the opposite, which means that energy and materials consumption is growing and users are usually not empowered by digitization, but rather they lose power. What does that mean? Digital transformation so far is not really sustainable. My third thesis, if we are to really fully use digital transformation in the interest of sustainability, we first of all have to an analyze why we haven't done it 
as of now. I am all in favor of a very sober, down-to-earth analysis as our first step. And I would like to mention a few ideas regarding such an analysis. My presentation will be focused very much, as you could already see, on uh, energy, material, and self-determination. Let me talk about energy first. Tillman and Constanza have already highlighted history, and history that took place uh, 70 years ago. I looked at the efficiency of information technologies uh, 70 years ago. So that was the INIAC electronic computer. It was still based on tubes. And in order to perform a thousand calculation opera operations automatically, you needed a kilowatt hour of energy. That is to say, you invest one kilowatt hour and uh, you get thousand calculation operations. The laptop that you are using today can manage a billion calculation operations, uh, computation operations with one kilowatt hour. So that is a very high number, one billion. That's a very huge amount of operations, which means that the development of energy efficiency in information technology is unprecedented. Every 19 months, we see a doubling in the number of operations uh, you can perform with the same amount of energy. Now, a simple consideration. We have an improvement of energy efficiency, and that should mean we use less energy for IT. That should have happened long ago. But at the same time, I just uh, remind you of Tillman's picture. He showed you that the overall energy consumption in the ICT sector is growing exp exponentially. That seems a bit paradox. And computing uh, centers are complaining that they need more and more electricity and they invest a lot into energy efficiency. The try to reduce the power usage effectiveness, the overall power consumption of uh, the uh, computing center compared to the energy needed for the very for the computers. But you on top of that also have uh, air conditioning and so on and so forth. They have uh, reduced uh, energy consumption by one fifth uh, and to a level of 1.1. Uh, one would be perfect. Now, and if you talk to people in computing centers and you ask them why do you, are you trying so hard to bring down energy consumption you can just wait 19 months and see that your energy efficiency of information technology is getting better automatically usually the answer to that response would be well, people want to have more as well. They make higher demands. From an economic perspective, it doesn't come as a surprise that uh, users would like to get better performance because the processors do not only get more energy efficient, they also need less time, they need less space, uh, less weight. And that is to say, people are using information technologies more. That is a kind of rebound or uh, backfire effect. That is to say, things get faster, cheaper, and there's a higher demand for the, such things. So we shouldn't ignore the fact that we have an increase in consumer demands. What does that mean for synchronicity? Whenever a, an equipment is replaced by a more efficient one, we see the growth also in the usage, and all possible savings are completely eaten up before you can really reap the benefit of such savings because of the higher usage. So we have to get out of this treadmill of constant growth and increase in usage unless we 
do that, we cannot reap the full benefit of energy efficiency increases. Let's talk about materials. Capturing, processing, and transferring data ne needs not only less energy, but also less material nowadays. We can say that every one or two years, the number of transistors uh, doubles that you can put on one single microchip. Because of the higher integration dens density, the computing performance of a chip is increasing. Nonetheless, we use not more material. So it's also a miracle of efficiency. Of course, technical development is slowly reaching physical limits, but our materials efficiency is still increasing. That doesn't come as a surprise. And we, are, we here again see um, the economic um, control logic. Whenever the performance of individual chips is uh, improving, more and more equipment is being offered and the market wants more. This doubling of uh, what you can have, the doubling of the performance has become so normal you don't notice it anymore. So the progress in materials in ten materials efficiency causes costs. When the first microprocessor was built in 1971, it took 12 different met metals to produce it. Today we have over 50 different types of metals, including in our electronic devices. Most of the material is used only in very tiny quantities. We have a higher efficiency, but we have a higher materials complexity. Even when industrial conditions are perfect, we can at maximum recycle 17 out of the 50 materials. Over 30 materials are wasted. They are just dispersed in the environment, and it is impossible to recycle that material. That is to say, we are making it impossible for future generations to use these rare materials. And on top of that, the recycling uh, of material is inadequate. Over 50% of all the electronic uh, scrap is not being recycled at all, even in the most developed industrial countries. Recycling is, uh, of course, much better than using just primary resources, but recycling does not contribute much to the saving of our resources because we do not have a full cycle of electronic materials reuse. The only consequence would be by a computer more rarely. It doesn't help you to bring down en energy consumption in the utilization phase of uh, electronic uh, devices, but it slows down the use of primary raw materials, recycling, and waste. So uh, I'm usually forced to buy new products in a way. I cannot say I'm going to use my, my, my device endlessly. And that brings me to my last topic, self-determination. I think we need to carry out a technology impact assessment. We would always have to think about what a dictatorship would do with such a new technology. But that's a topic that is too comprehensive for the purpose of my presentation. And maybe we can discuss that at uh, other fora during the conference. I am going to speak about informational self-determination. Uh, I think it's an important question. Susanna has mentioned it. But um, let me just focus on another aspect of self-determination. Namely, materials and equipment controlled by software, can they turn against the interests of their owners? This is a question of self-determination that is not yet very much research, but we have seen so many scandals already. And the scandals we have seen so far, just the tip of the iceberg, we can have seen and in the case of diesel, what can happen to a diesel engine when controlled by software? This software was programmed in a way that it would recognize, is the uh, car on a test rig? Then they pretended to have the ideal exhaust gas situations that you can never achieve 
when you ride on the road. So this scandal, this very process should uh, be a cause for concern for us because it shows that e equipment can no longer, or it is possible to uh, program equipment in a way that it can no longer fully be controlled by the owner anymore. It is industry that will keep control over the software. Now imagine what that could mean for the future, what it could mean when we have artificial intelligence and could use it and program it for similar purposes. Uh, not only cars, but even uh, fridges and other devices uh, with software where were found to sometimes act against the interests of their owners. Maybe in order to manipulate uh, test results uh, in the case of uh, cars or uh, fridges, or it was used to uh, plan obsolescence uh, for some equipment, uh, or in order to prevent re filling, for instance, printers and uh, the cartridges for printers. Many of those programmings go against the interests of owners. Computers who are linked to industry can be influenced by the manufacturers in real time. So the Internet of Things in that respect seems to be a master plan for the devaluation of material goods on the basis of software. We need to fear that something like that will happen because more and more categories of equipment, of uh, goods, of instruments that we use will be computer controlled, will be software controlled, will become obsolete uh, prematurely because no more software update will be available. Now, in a market economy, why is it necessary to be supported by a software manufacturer? I mean, maybe one day in your smartphone there will be an information to the private users. You have to refurbish your apartment because your toilet will no longer be uh, available because of a lack of uh, up-to-date software. Here are the addresses of uh, qualified staff to do your refurbishment at home. Well, you can click and choose one of those uh, specialists or you can refuse to live in that department. So. I think we also are going to see new marketing phases. No more advertising will be necessary. And this means exactly the opposite that we wanted to achieve on the basis of digitalization. What we wanted to do is to create new value in uh, services. And we wanted to decouple the services from the material. Digital technology would be right the proper technology for this dematerialization. Software was invented not in order to prevent re, uh, the uh, acquisition of new hardware. Software made it possible to use our hardware universally. Software comes and go, but hardware will stay. Software is creative and specific. Hardware is universal. And that is the principle of the universal machine. And in informatics, in IT, it's our basic principle. But IT industry manages over the last 30 years to turn this principle upside down. Today, immaterial software is used to put pressure on people to replace their hardware. This is exactly the opposite of sustainability. Now, let me sum up my presentation. First of all, the relationship between uh, digitalization and sustainability as it has developed in our given economic framework can best be characterized as a systematic 
missed opportunity. I am saying we systematically missed this opportunity because missing the opportunity did not happen quite by chance. We have to think about how it happened. It is not accidental. It is has something to do with the rules that are the foundation for our economic system. We have to think about those rules. Today, we are right in the middle of missing this opportunity to link digitalization and sustainability. We allow digitalization to become a tool to disenfranchise people. That will lead to a devaluation of uh, valuable materials with the help of software, not just within our system. Increasingly, we also see such a process going on outside IT-based uh, products, the Internet of Things. That is the next wave of material use and the next battle we are going to see for consumers. Well, probably we will have to uh, overcome those patterns of consumption that we have at the moment. Many legal requisites will be required for it. Uh, many of them have uh, been mentioned already. There is such an approach as the right to repair uh, developed in the U.S. That's interesting, but generally the rights of our consumers must be strengthened. And we finally also need more creative business models that are not based on creating value by transforming material and energy. We should rather focus on creating value on the basis of, again, creative uh, services. And many of those ideas that I have just sketched will probably be discussed time and again during this conference. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, wonderful keynote speech. Thank you, Tillman. Thank you, Constanza, for this introduction. You have now heard what the link is between bits and trees. Many topics were already addressed. And so we can talk about all of them, uh, footprint issues, software obsolescence, and the critique of digital capitalism has already been mentioned. We have also addressed the major question of responsibility, a universal and uh, maybe sustainable machine. This is what we are going to discuss in much more detail over the next two days. And since it's a very complex program, allow me to give you some indications how to work. We thought we would have seven different tracks. You would find the seven tracks in the uh, schedule, and they are indicated in different color. Here on this st stage, after the break, we are going to talk about the material basis. What is the weight of a bit? The y question of this panel here is uh, the color, sorry, is yellow. So everything that concerns the material basis will be discussed here. Here we're going to talk about the footprint. Here we are going also to talk about the raw materials problems and concerns that we have. We are going to talk about material aspects of hardware. All of that can be discussed in workshops, in talks, with the yellow color in your program. And then if you'd like to talk about more about the materials, having heard the short intro, you can go to Room Delfo. Then we have Orange, that is alternative management. Here we are going to talk about uh, free software, cooperativism, alternative business models, and the responsibility of entrepreneurs and enterprises. The Orange track will be conducted on the Emacs stage, and the workshops will be in the Room Birke. It is easy to find the different rooms. You just follow the program languages and 
you just follow the trees for the Berg, uh, workshops. So Emacs and Berg, Birke will be for alternative managements, alternative economy. Then we have the green track, everything that concerns data protection and the environment, because we have to think about those two things if we want to have a sustainable digital future. Digital energy transformation, also a very important topic here, or database solutions for ecological sustainability. All of these topics will be discussed on the closure stage and in the COCOS workshop room, if you would like to do something tangible and practical. Then we have red. Red is the critique of digital capitalism, should be red, of course. And all of that will be shown in the mesh hall. On Sunday, we are going to continue this line of discussion because we cannot really house all the tracks here. In the workshop room Durian, you can think practically about your position regarding automation, data-driven corporations and automated futures. And uh, there you can think about how to exchange knowledge and develop solutions. Then we have blue. City, land and smart. Of course, we do not want to uh, use the smart city concept as uh, uh, un reflected as it is oftentimes mentioned, reclaim the smart is our slogan. It's about mobility, network, agriculture, and also the country and the rural areas in general. That's the blue track. And uh, you are going to meet in room Erle. Then there are two other tracks. One concerns civil society and, and communities. Both things belong together, and here we gave this track a purple color. There you, you can get to meet many projects and practical ideas. So these are our networked formats. We are going to talk about open source activism, how to support one another as activists, especially when you work with the public. And uh, we are going to talk about how to bring into our efforts as many people as possible. This uh, purple track can be followed on all stages, and we also have a workshop room for you. This is a Ahorn, Acorn. This room is located on level one, that is to say, one floor up. Then you will feel our main level where you find all the stages and uh, the forum with all the different initiatives and organizations. And there will be two workshop rooms, Ahorn and the chat room that I mentioned, where you can continue your discussions and uh, exchange ideas. And the last track is pink, the big issues that we have already addressed now philosophical issues, political issues, uh, big thinkers are going to be present there. So everything that uh, can be thought also in terms of a utopia, that can be found in the pink rooms and the workshop rooms are again located on the upper floor and the third floor. So hopefully this information about this very complex uh, track-based program will help you to orient yourself and find the things you would like to do, to do or discover. Now, let's move on to some more housekeeping notes. If you are getting restless and you think, well, I don't want to sit here all day long, I'd like to do something practical. Once again, I invite you to help us prepare lunch. Lunch will be after the next panel here at uh, 1.30. On this level and one floor up, our video operations center 
who does the live stream also needs a few more assistance. So today you can start your technical career. Go and see the information desk if you want to work with our technical team or just uh, talk to the camera operators. They will give you uh, instructions. We would like to have your support because our people were active all night long and haven't slept much. They need to be replaced at some point. So anyway, what's going to happen today here in this room? So we we'll continue at 12 o'clock with the question, how heavy is a bit? I mean, the physical basics, we lay the foundation for that question. And then we shall continue between three and half past four. In the next step, we shall be answering the question, how can we adopt a different alternative economy, digital degrowth um, is the buzzword in this re respect and then we continue with the panel reclaim smart city and uh, in the evening we'll have the philosophical salon um, in order to round out the day with a big question but i mean after this uh, chalk and talk you don't really feel like looking into philosophical issues you can either spend some more t uh, more time uh, eating or look elsewhere go to the other stages or also go to the Spora this is infotainment concerning lots of topics. We also curated that. And uh, anyway, stay in this building because we continue with a small impromptu concert. And then, of course, we will be able to have a pint of beer or cocktails at the bar and uh, burn the midnight oil, uh, rescue the world and improve it uh, over.